Well, good morning. morning. A cold and wet one, of course, but it's great to be indoors with a little bit of warmth and uh, just trust that we know God's blessing as we worship him today. And of course, we extend a welcome to those who are watching online via the recorded service. And uh, we are glad to be here uh, as God's people to worship him on this, this Sabbath day. But before we turn to worship, I just want to share a few announcements. Uh, First of all, today I'll be starting a church membership class which will focus on the central message of the Bible as it applies to us and the response it demands. The course is entitled Getting Connected and will comprise three group sessions in Drummer Coast Church Hall followed by a one-to-one meeting in the manse. The course is for people of all ages, so if you're interested, please come along to the first of the fortnightly sessions taking place today at three, and that runs for about an hour in Drumacos Minor Hall. I'm pleased to announce that our Kirk session has met and agreed that all church groups and organisations can now recommence meetings within the church premises with the proviso that all COVID-related mitigations are in place. Next Sunday, God willing, I'll be doing a pulpit swap with the Reverend Clive Glass and I'm sure you'll give him a good Darren Moore welcome as he comes to lead worship. Also next Sunday, the League of Church Loyalty Cards will be available, and uh, with church attendance being recorded at the end of the service. And if you know anyone who would like our church prayer team to pray for them, uh, a written request can be put in the vestibule. That's all I have. I'm going to invite Alex now to come uh, to bring us one more announcement. Thanks, Alex. Good morning, everyone. Um, I just wanted to let you all know that we're going to start back at our children's church next week. That will be a big relief for those people with smaller children, primary school age children. And um, we've got a rota made out. It's just at the vestibule, if you want to look at it on the way out. John's going to put it up onto the screen next week as well. And that's just during the service. The children can go out. Anybody with very small, tiny Children are more than welcome to also join us, but if if it's a very small child, we would like the parent to stay. You're not going to lose out because uh, John is able to relay the service into the main hall TV. So you can go out, the child can go into it with the rest of the children, but also enjoy the service being relayed into the hall. And I would appeal to my band of merry helpers. Um, I've used all the names that we did before, and we should have a few more coming on as well, if that's okay. Anybody has any issues with their names or dates that don't suit them, just ask somebody else to do a wee swap or come to me. It'll be no problem. Um, we will have some resources. They're coming more this week. I'll have a wee some children's church box made up with some leaflets inside some lessons for you if you feel you want to do it that way you're free to do it yourself like you did before and uh, and we'll have that all ready next week so I'll kick it off next week so then after that I'll just run as a rota thank you very much thank you Alex we have come to worship God and as we do so I want us just to reflect on these verses that we find at the beginning of Psalm 98 There we read, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvellous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. At the end of the earth, all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Let's join together in prayer. Let's pray. Loving Father, as we bow before you today, we're very conscious of the debt of gratitude we owe you for who you are and for all you have done through Christ our Saviour. And we thank you, Lord, that this good news has been going right around the world for centuries now. And we have had the privilege of hearing that good news ourselves. And we've been reminded over recent weeks as we have Uh, studied your word and reflected on it that that good news isn't just for us but it's for every person on this planet and we thank you that in your word you tell us whenever people come to realize that you have done all possible uh, for their salvation then we can rejoice so we rejoice today lord in the knowledge that you have saved us and that you have made it possible for us to know you as our friend as well as our savior 
And we pray that that message that is going out today right across the world will find hearts that are receptive to it and be ready to receive Jesus as their saviour. And we pray that the, heaven, that the, the angels in heaven will be rejoicing today as many turn to you in faith. And for ourselves gathered here today, we ask, Lord, that you would be speaking into our hearts and drawing us to the Saviour. And ask, Lord, that all we do during this time of worship will give glory to him. Thank you, Lord, for all your goodness to us in Jesus. And thank you, Lord, that you are here with your Spirit now, by your Spirit, to lead us and guide us into all truth. Help us to be receptive to all you want to do in our lives at this time that we may give glory to our Saviour. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to begin our service by standing to sing as the deer pants for the water. Well, that was an unexpected interlude. 
God, yes, yeah, a lovely hymn too. Uh, I almost felt we should join in and sing along, but uh, yes, technical issues do arise from time to time. Thanks for sorting that out, John and Chris. So where are we? Yes, children's talk. <laughs> I thought maybe we would skip forward in the service a wee bit there. So there's a few children here today, and it's always good to see you. And I want to, well, hopefully if we get the technical side going with the slides, I want to show you a few pictures. But first of all, I want to ask you the question, how did you get to church today? How did you get to church? Did you come in a helicopter? No. No, of course you didn't. <laughs> no, it'd be nice maybe to do that. Maybe not in that weather, of course. Maybe on a better day. Well, did anyone come on a motorbike? No, not on a motorbike. I didn't come on a motorbike. Uh, I'm quite glad because a lot of big puddles between here and uh, Killian Road. Uh, what about anyone come in the car? Yeah. Oh, yes. I think most of us came in the car. Yes. Anyone come in a hovercraft? <laughs> what about a bus? Anyone come on a bus? No, no buses. Might struggle to get up that wee road, actually, in a bus. What about a train? Anyone come on a train? No, I didn't think so. There's no train tracks around here. Sure there isn't. Well, there was once a little boy who went on a train journey, but he had a terrible fear of going through tunnels. He hated it whenever the train disappeared into the darkness of the tunnel, and he knew that the journey that they were about to go on had a tunnel. And he was very upset about it. He was really worried. However, he explained to his mum and dad that he, he then prayed about it and was confident that God would take the tunnel away. And, yep, yeah, he believed that. And having asked God to do this, he was now very happy that God would solve the problem and the tunnel would vanish and he wouldn't have to worry about it. Now, while this young boy was very happy about the matter, his parents were somewhat perturbed. In fact, they were deeply troubled because the day of the train journey was approaching and they weren't sure how their son would react when they arrived at the tunnel. And what would, when going through the tunnel, what would it do for the boy's faith? Because he believed that God was going to take the tunnel away. When he discovered that the tunnel was still there, would he stop trusting God, whom he had believed would take the tunnel away? And the parents were wondering, how are they going to prepare this young lad for the journey? And they couldn't get past his belief that God was taking the tunnel away for him. After all, the young lad would say, I've prayed about this and I'm sure that God will take the tunnel away. Well, the day of the journey finally arrived and a perfectly happy little boy and a very worried mum and dad got on the train, not quite sure of what was going to happen. The journey began, and just about 10 minutes into the journey, the young boy fell asleep. And he slept for the rest of the journey, through the tunnel and all. And so, for that little boy, God had indeed removed the tunnel. He wasn't, the young boy wasn't aware of it at all. God had answered his prayer, but perhaps in a way he hadn't expected, or indeed how his parents, that they wouldn't have expected it either. And the lesson for us is this, whenever we're worried or scared about something, God wants us to come to him and pray just as the little boy did and ask him, ask God to help us. And sometimes, well, we do believe God answers prayer, but sometimes he answers it in ways that are unexpected, just as the little boy in the story. He was convinced because he prayed to God, God would take the tunnel away. And in his own way, he did. Physically, it was still there, but for the young boy, he was spared the anguish of going through that dark tunnel. The Bible says this. It says that God is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. Sometimes when we're praying, we can limit God. We can put him in a box, but actually God can do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. So the next time you're worried or upset about something, remember the lesson of the little boy who prayed and God answered his prayer in an unexpected way. And he will do the same for us. Sometimes he may answer in a way we hope for or expect. But there will be many times that he'll answer, he'll answer in a different way, an unexpected way. So we're going to pray now. So let's bow our heads and talk to God. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us so much. And you love it whenever we come to you in prayer. And sometimes we come and we want to praise you and thank you for who you are and what you've done for us. 
And there are other times whenever we're struggling and we're facing difficulties. Thank you, Lord, that when we come to you in prayer, you always listen and you always answer. And sometimes, like the little boy in the story, you answer us in the unexpected ways. So help us to be ready for that too, knowing that you know what's best for us and you know what will bring you glory. Lord, thank you for hearing our prayer. Amen. Well, boys and girls, we're going to sing a song now that reminds us of the greatness of God. And if you know the actions, please join in. Let's stand and sing, Our God is a Great Big God. to come before God in prayer now so let us let us pray father as we come before you today we're very conscious of those who are in need of your help and in our prayers we want to bring before you those who are struggling with various issues in their lives and we know at this time many are struggling due to health issues and so we want to pray for those who are in hospital receiving medical care for those who are tending to them doctors and nurses and support staff within our hospitals Asking that those that we know who are in this situation of ill health will know your presence and your blessing and indeed they will know healing in these days. We remember also those who have returned home after a recent hospital procedure or treatment. Asking Father that they too would know your loving presence. And be with loved ones who are anxious for those who are unwell at this time. As they pray for their loved ones may they be granted a sense of your peace and assurance as they continue to remember those close to them. We also remember those within our care homes who are struggling due to different issues. We know for some, Lord, it's a difficult time because uh, friends and family are not allowed to visit just at this time. We know that some can keep in contact by phone. Um, we just pray that those times uh, will be a blessing. Uh, to those who are talking to their loved ones within a care home. We remember the staff there for the good work they do, often under challenging circumstances, that they would know your grace and your strength. And indeed, we pray for all within the healthcare service. Lord, that you be with them during these challenging days, strengthening them and giving them wisdom 
and watching over them. We do pray for the ongoing situation with regards to COVID-19. We've had to live with it these past two years, and we know, Lord, going forward that it's going to remain with us. But we do pray for all that our health service is doing, for all that scientists and researchers are doing uh, to produce vaccine for the future. And we pray that you will continue to guide us as your people, that we would be wise in the way we live and how we look after each other. We continue to pray for those at government level charged with making important decisions in these matters. Guide them, give them wisdom, and enable us, Lord, to follow the guidance that, we're, that we are given and that we would set a good example to those around us. We do pray for those within our community who are suffering due to COVID at this time, that you'd be close to them, Lord, that you would keep them well, that their symptoms would not be too severe, and that you would bring them through this, and that we would continue to support each other in these challenging days. We thank you for the ministry here in Dara Moore. Thank you for all that you've been doing in our midst, and especially now, Lord, that uh, organizations are able to meet again. We pray that that will be a great blessing to, to young and old, uh, to everyone who comes along uh, to the meetings happening over the next month or so. Um, we pray that those will be good times together, renewed fellowship, and as teaching is shared from your word, that people will be built up in their faith. We pray particularly for the young folk and, and others, Lord, adults, even considering coming along to your church membership class, that you will bless them as we engage with your word. And we just pray that you will be speaking into the lives of all those who are considering church membership at this time, drawing them to the Saviour and encouraging them to find their place within our church fellowship going forward. And as we take time to reflect on your word today, Lord, give us hearts that are receptive, minds that are open, that we may respond to your word. And indeed, Lord, we would do that in faith, believing in you and trusting you to go forward and live out that word. So guide us now, Lord, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you would turn with me to Psalm 139, uh, we may have words on the screen, of course, so you may not have to turn with, with me at all, but just read it off the screen. And um, we're in the Old Testament today, and I'm reading from that well-known Psalm, Psalm 139, commencing at verse 1. This is the word of God. Of course, this is the psalmist David writing. He says, O Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in, behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise in the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day. For darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Amen. And we know God will bless this reading of his word to our hearts today. I'm going to ask Chris to come and lead us in our next praise. Jesus, all for Jesus.
Last Sunday we were praying for children who had just received results of transfer tests and of course other children and young people are busy studying away for GCSEs and A-levels and some of them will be hoping to progress to a college or university where they'll study for yet more exams. I came across a story recently about four students who decided to go out for the night rather than study for an exam that was scheduled for the next day. In the morning, they came up with a plan. They made themselves look as messy as they could with grease and dirt. Then they went to the lecturer and said that they'd gone out to a wedding party the night before and as they returned, a tire on their car burst and they had to push the car all the way back so they were in no condition to sit the test. So the lecturer said that they could have a retest after three days. They thanked him and said that they'd be ready for it. Three days later, they appeared before the lecturer. He said that this, as this was a special circumstances test, all four were required to sit in separate rooms for the exam. They all agreed, as they had prepared well over the previous three days. The test consisted of two questions, with a total of 100 marks. Question one, name the model of the car. <laughs> two marks. Question two was multiple choice. Which tire burst? A, front left, B, front right, C, rear left, D, rear right, 98 marks. Now, there are three possible lessons we can learn from this story. One, if you want to pass exams, then you need to study and not go to parties. Two, your lies will find you out. Three, something else we learn from this is planning is important. Careful planning is required if we hope to achieve a positive outcome. It's important to plan, of course. And in life, there are all kinds of plans. Lesson plans, floor plans, business plans, personal development plans, and of course, there's also family planning, financial or budget planning, project planning, and so on. All kinds of plans that can be useful in different ways. But today I want to tell you about a plan that is infinitely more important, infinitely even more important than any of those I've just mentioned. And of course, I'm talking about God's plan for your life and his plan for my life. How do we know that God has a plan? There is a plan for each of us. Well, because the Bible tells us God had a plan for us before he created the world. In, in Ephesians 1 verse 4, it says, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ. Some people claim that we're here just because of some big accident. But David reminds us in the Psalms that God was instrumental in our coming into existence. In Psalm 139 that I just read from, he says to God, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. And in the previous Psalm, David declares, the Lord will work out his plans for my life. For your faithful love, O Lord, endures forever. So if we take God at his word, it's clear that he has a plan for us. But how do we find out what that plan looks, looks like? How do we find out what God's will is for our lives? How can we know what he wants us to do? Well, the first thing I want to say is that if we're genuine in our desire to, in finding the best path through life, we need to realize that we need help. In every situation that you or I encounter in life where we need guidance or there's an issue that needs to be resolved, there are a number of things we can do. We all face choices in life, whether it's picking subjects for school or college, plotting a career path, deciding whether to get married or where to live. The list is endless. In each of these situations and many others, we have a choice to make and it's this. Will we follow God's advice or not? Will we listen to what he has to say or will we just do our own thing? In the Bible, we find very clear guidance that can help us in our quest for finding God's will for our life. And this guidance I've summarized in four, into four points. First of all, praying. Praying to God. Asking for advice. Reading the Bible. And trusting God for the outcome. Praying, asking, reading, and trusting. If we're genuine in our desire to find out what God wants us to do, the starting point should always be prayer taking the situation to him. 
A number of years ago, I succumbed to the effects of stress, and I shared this with the men's ministry group uh, before Christmas. And at that time, I found myself completely overwhelmed, physically, mentally, and spiritually. Within the space of a fortnight, I had three panic attacks, and in between these, there, there was the constant feeling of anxiety, so much so that I struggled to even pray about my predicament. As a minister, I've sometimes heard people say that they can't pray, and until the events of that time in my own life, I never really understood why, but now I know. Suffering physical pain and mental anguish and not knowing why has to be one of the hardest experiences a human being can go through. So what, what turned things around? Well, a significant thing happened one evening when I got to my lowest point. Um, realizing that I needed help, my wife Gillian prayed for me. And was her prayer answered straight away? Well, no. But what I can tell you is after she prayed, there immediately came a sense of hope that I hadn't felt for a long time. Now, hope isn't always a good thing. Uh, for example, I remember a friend talking about the game of golf, and he said that it's the hope that kills you. Now, you, you who have tried playing golf will understand what he meant. Uh, but when it comes to a hope, when it comes to hope that's based on something or someone who's completely dependable, well, that's a different story. The kind of hope I'm talking about is summed up perfectly in the first line of Edward Moat's famous hymn. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. When you have that kind of hope, then life and life's struggles take on a new meaning and significance. Hope in anything or anyone else may prove helpful in some ways, but often it won't. Certainly it won't be a lasting hope because we are all fallen people in a fallen world. And try as we might, we will frequently let other people down, even those we love, and in turn be disappointed by them. The only way we can have a hope that we're sure of is to put our trust in God and his son, Jesus Christ. In the days leading up to his crucifixion, Jesus wanted his disciples to face the future with hope in their hearts. And so he encouraged them with these words, trust in God and trust also in me. You see, closely linked with hope is faith. Referring to faith, someone has said, faith is seeing light with your heart when all your eyes see is darkness. Sometimes when we feel overwhelmed by our problems, we, we see only darkness. And this can lead to feelings of despair. Often that will be due to an overdependence on our physical sense of sight. The Apostle Paul was well aware of this tendency when he wrote these words. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. When we're under pressure, when we're facing difficulties or dealing with a crisis, our first in inclination is to focus on our circumstances and think, how can I deal with this? What am I going to do? In order to cope with the situation, we tend to rely on our own strength or, or we look to other people for help. And although we may sometimes be able to do something to help ourselves, or others may come to our assistance. There's someone who will always be there for us. We can't see him because the Bible tells us that he is spirit. But God has promised to be our constant companion. If only we put our trust in him. To be honest, there have been many times over the years when I've wondered if my faith was real. And one of the precious things I was reminded of during that time when I felt overwhelmed was that my faith was real. You see, faith is a gift from God. It's not something that we can work up within ourselves. But sometimes that God-given belief must be tested. In Matthew chapter 14, we read of an, ama an amazing experience one of Jesus' disciples had one evening. As he and his companions made their way across a rather choppy sea of Galilee. We pick the story up at uh, verse 25 of Matthew 14. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake when the disciples saw him walking on the lake they were terrified it's a ghost they said and they cried out in fear but Jesus immediately said to them take courage it is I 
Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand, caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. We may say that we believe in God, but when difficulties come, how will we react? Will our faith fail? Or will we be like Peter and call out to the only one who can save us? The only one who can rescue us? You see, when the crunch comes, it's not not about what you or I can do, but rather about what God is willing and able to do. When Peter started to sink in the waves, he couldn't save himself. So he called out in faith to the one who could. When we reach that point when we're grappling for a hold and anything we think will keep our heads above water, we need to remember Peter's response in his moment of crisis and trust the Lord to help us. This is the kind of faith that Matt Redmond describes in his song, You Never Let Go. Listen to these lyrics that speak of a determination to trust God. Even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of life, I won't turn back. I know you are near. And I will fear no evil, for my God is with me. And if my God is with me, whom then shall I fear? When our faith is challenged and we're struggling to find our way, God has promised to be there with us and for us. Through his prophet Isaiah, he encouraged his people saying, I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. And such was King David's awareness of God's presence and provision. He was able to write, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise in the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If we have this kind of faith, if we put our trust fully in an all-powerful, all-knowing, compassionate, grace-filled God, then we'll be able to join with the refrain of Redmond's song and sing, Oh no, you never let go. Through the calm and through the storm, oh no, you never let go. And every high and every low, oh no, you never let go. Lord, you never let go of me. That time in my life when I felt overwhelmed, leading me to take time off work, was tough. But I emerged with a renewed assurance that God is with me and he has a good plan for my life. Earlier I referred to children and young people studying for exams. When I was going through the process of preparing to enter the ordained ministry, I had to achieve a grade B in A-level religious studies to be accepted by Queen's University onto the degree course. At the first attempt, I got a C. And although I had already been formally accepted by the General Assembly as a student for the ministry, my application was rejected by Queen's. Well, you can imagine my disappointment. There were those who told me that perhaps God had another plan for me. And there were some who told me to persevere. The Sunday after I got the disappointing news from the university, I was worshipping with my family in Hazelbank Church in Korean. The congregation was vacant at the time. And so there was a guest speaker, Peter Crawford, Peter Crawford, who works with the European Christian Mission. And that morning, as Peter spoke about the life of David, the shepherd boy who became a king, he read these words from Psalm 18. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is flawless. It is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. Having sought God's will, having worked so hard and then had the disappointment, this was exactly what Jillian and I needed to hear. And many times since, those words of the psalmist have brought me great encouragement. God has a plan for every one of us gathered here today. So my question to you is this. Have you discovered his plan for your life? To begin that process of discovery, you must let go of any thought that you can work things out for yourself and let go of anything that's keeping you from fully trusting God. 
When it comes to finding out your will for his life, you have a part to play. P-A-R-T. Pray, ask, read, and trust. Over the coming weeks, it's my desire that we'll explore each of these spiritual practices in more depth. But for today, let's remember the process of discovering God's plan for our lives begins with prayer. For some of you here today, you've committed your life to God and you're living for him. And that will mean continuing to trust him. For others who have faced disappointments and are finding themselves struggling, it will mean asking God for the ability to get through that difficulty. The ability to persevere in the midst of trials. And for some of you, it will be asking God to forgive you for ignoring him or for failing to trust him. If that's the case, you have nothing to fear because when we confess our failure and our sin, God has promised to forgive us and clear away everything that's wrong in our lives. That's what he can do. And that, my friends, is the power of the cross because Jesus has done it all. Our debt has been paid in full. All we need to do is accept the salvation he offers. Build our lives on him and remember that all other ground is sinking sand. Amen. Let's join together in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you and praise you that you have a plan for each of our lives. A plan that you had in mind even before you created this world. That in itself is a wonderful thing. But to discover that plan, we need to connect with you. Through your word, you've reminded us today that prayer is a starting point in the process of getting to know you and to get to know your will for us. So help us to take time each day to talk to you and give you the priority you deserve. Help us also to spend time reading your word so that we may hear you speaking into our situation and be better equipped to deal with the issues we face. Thank you for the hope you've given us through your son's victory over death. And for the assurance of your forgiveness when we trust in his finished work on the cross. Lord, grant us the faith to believe and keep believing, especially when times are tough. Thank you that when we trust in you, your spirit comes to reside within us, to lead us and guide us. So whatever stage we're at in the journey of life, the journey of faith, help us to acknowledge our need of your help and build our lives on the only sure foundation, Jesus who is the rock of our salvation. We thank you that you are a God we can depend on, one who keeps his promises. We praise you for your faithfulness and trust that you will guide us as we seek to discover more of your will for our lives. And as you reveal your plan for us, Lord, may we be obedient in living it out so that you are honoured and glorified. For we ask it in our Saviour's name. Amen. We're going to stand again to praise God now in the words of that lovely hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
Loving Father, we thank you that out of your goodness to us, we can present this offering today and ask, Lord, that you would take it and use it for the glory of your name. Amen. We close with the benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Be still with, with a bit of I and Audi. Well, thank you so much.
Thank you.